All right, welcome to today's call, everybody. Uh, this one will be a really interesting one. I'm hoping to hear a lot of great um, feedback and ideas from you guys, too. Um, our topic today is going to be all about, uh, or <laughs> all about what we know right now about hygiene, cleaning, and then I'll dip a little bit into some of the reopening um, issues that are specific to those um, to those cases as well. Um, so our, our agenda for today will be very similar to other calls. We'll start with a quick tutorial on how to use Zoom. Uh, we'll cover some basic ground rules. I'll give you an update on uh, what we've been doing in the, in the greater climbing community internationally and what's going on there. And then I'll give you a little update on uh, some of the key issues that we're tracking, what we know about those issues at the moment, and uh, tell you what you can do um, to help out and, uh, and uh, give good guidance to the entire climbing industry. Uh, the meat of today's call will be a brainstorm session. So I'd really like for you guys to share ideas, whether that's in the chat, the question and answer dialogue, or using that raise hand feature uh, that Zoom has and give you a chance to speak. Um, we have a couple, um, try, try to make this very open so that uh, you guys can get all of your ideas and questions out there into the open. This is a, this is a, a really, um, uh, real-time situation where guidance is going to be developed over weeks, months, and I'm sure for the broader medical community over years until there's really any final answers on a lot of these questions that we're all going to have. Um, so I'll get started with this uh, quick Zoom tutorial. Um, as always, we are going to have the chat available to you guys. You can chat just to um, the panelists, but if you want to chat amongst yourselves, make sure you select all panelists and attendees. That's going to make sure that whatever you type in is, is visible to everybody. Um, again, uh, the question and answer dialog box will be there for you to use. If you see someone's already asked a question that you would really like answered, just go ahead and upvote that with the thumb and uh, we'll make sure that any of those get addressed. And as, as we go through some of these um, preliminary slides and the start of this conversation, just go ahead and start dumping questions in there, start chatting with each other, and we'll, we'll get a lively discussion going uh, once we open up once we open this up to the brainstorming session. Um, and again, if you want to say something out loud, just go ahead and hit raise hand. It's right there at the very lower center of your screen. And then um, as soon as you do, I'll uh, unmute you and uh, you'll get a little pop-up box. Just click unmute myself and you'll be ready to speak right away. Um, as always, our ground rules, um, we just request that you be polite and respectful to each other. Uh, this conversation, especially with a lot of developments recently, there might be a chance for some personal political commentary. Just please keep that down. Let's focus on um, the topic at hand. If you do get unmuted, uh, just limit your comments to about two minutes. That way um, everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, and then as always, anyone who abuses uh, anyone else will, will remove uh, you from the call just to keep everything flowing smoothly. Um, I wanted to start by giving you guys an update on what the CWA is doing. I, we have that coronavirus resource page and hopefully you guys are all making good use of that and, and getting um, some of the basic information you need. Um, but right now everything's developing so quickly that um, what we're trying to do at the CWA is mostly monitor the current science, monitor the current best practices from other organizations around the world and uh, try to develop the guidance and um, materials that you guys need to make some of the decisions you're going to have to be making uh, as soon as you start to reopen. Um, Right now, a lot of the major um, climbing organizations around the world have started work groups or have just started work groups uh, to work on these specific questions around hygiene, cleaning, and reopening. Uh, we've been in touch with almost all of them. There's a couple newly launched programs, uh, one by the IFSC um, as of last Thursday, and then one by the DAV in Germany as of uh, yesterday. Um, uh, beginning to work on these questions as well. Um, one of our goals at the CWA is to to keep all of these organizations in communication with each other and to learn from each other as we all have our individual groups that are working in whether it's a specific country or a specific area of the sport. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, the logo here, uh, the Climbing uh, Clutter Sport, um, is Christian Papin's uh, gym out of Germany. A lot of you have probably seen the Vertical Life um, uh, piece that came out as a strategy document. Christian was a, a big um, part of writing that and, and collating that information. Um, so we've definitely been in touch with them and, and keeping an eye on all of those kind of uh, things that get published out in the world, whether it's in the fitness industry or very specifically in the climbing industry. Um, to start off our brainstorm discussion, I thought we'd cover some of the things that we do know concretely and some of the things we know we don't know as well. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's useful to structure 
uh, this discussion into three components, uh, hygiene, cleaning, and then reopening, um, which is somewhat of an amalgamation of those other two, plus your individual uh, policies and your individual local government's uh, ordinances as well. Um, so just to cover some of the definitions again, we have on previous calls, but we'll use um, what we're what we're going to talk here, so we can have all have the same common language. Uh, we'll use these definitions. Hygiene's really about the behavior and the practices that you, your facility, and your climbers can do, and uh, how they behave. Um, so one thing that's important to note is that your gym is only going to be as low risk as your climbers. Um, I don't think it'd be too far out there to say, but please, anyone who disagrees. Um, you know, throw something into the chat, the question and answer, or raise your hand in a little bit once we open this up and, um, and you know, definitely weigh in with your thoughts as well. I, it seems that it's unrealistic to achieve a, uh, a perfectly safe climbing gym when it comes to um, almost anything, right? But the specific matter at hand uh, for COVID-19. And I don't think we necessarily need to um, to aim for that level. We need to aim for uh, as close to that as we can in some cases, but uh, don't try to treat your gym as a, as a, as a hospital room. It's a, it's a little unrealistic and it might hamper uh, other areas of your business uh, inadvertently. Um, when it comes to hygiene, uh, I think in the, in the climbing gym, in the fitness gyms, one of the key things, one of the most important things is to increase hand washing and make that a behavior that um, is ingrained in your staff and your customers. Um, another hygiene issue um, that that's come up in, in buzz between fitness industry and climbing industry um, is what the airborne nature of this uh, disease is and this specific virus. Uh, questions about putting UV sanitizers into HVAC systems, different types of filters, HEPA filters in the HVAC systems. Um, it doesn't seem like that's necessarily an area to focus on right now. And that's one of those things that might be very high cost to you um, without achieving uh, any greater results. Uh, and again, with the uh, ongoing caveat we'll have for this entire conversation that so much of the information is um, is you know in development and we'll just have to pay attention to it as as science uh, continues on. Um, and then with with those hygiene recommendations, you know having posters, making that guidance known to your customers is really going to help ease people's minds. And one of the things we need to be particularly sensitive to in our industry and then the greater leisure entertainment recreation industries as well are any sort of stigmas that people might have based around you know all of the concerns that are going on right now and all of the uncertainty that we're all facing. And having good guidance to people on what you're doing and what you expect them to do can, can really help um, make make those transitions a little bit easier when it comes to reopening. Um, on the cleaning, cleaning is is um, like a subset of hygiene, if you will. It's uh, it's the part of hygiene that's at the facility level. It's the way that you're, that you're going to have your facility behave um, to help communicate some of these um, uh, uh, low risk um, behaviors to your customers. Um, and again, with that continued caveat, research is ongoing onto what needs to be cleaned, how often it needs to be cleaned, and how you clean it. Um, there's definitely current best practices that, um, that we can lean on there, and we'll be covering a lot of those. And again, we'd love to hear your guys' ideas as well. Um, and when it comes to cleaning, uh, there's always a lot of focus on, on the climbing holds, which is um, uh, you know, obvious and, and very understood. But um, you should consider all areas of your gym if you haven't already. Um, locker rooms, the lockers themselves, um, restrooms, seating areas, the, the front desk, um, uh, the floor mats uh, and the floor itself. Um, a, lot of those, a lot of those are sometimes less uh, glamorous and they seem a little less scary than the climbing holds, but it's all part of the same larger facility picture. Um, and uh, when it comes to cleaning right now, uh, soap is, is one of your best friends, whether that's uh, personal hygiene like hand washing or facility level hygiene like cleaning holds or ropes or most soft goods. It's a, a fairly um, non-reactive uh, um, chemical. It's not going to harm a lot of our, of our um, surfaces and a lot of our materials. Um, but when you do use soap, uh, make sure you also pay attention to contact time. Um, that's a big part of, of the way that soap works to, um, to clean and disinfect things. Um, and there is, of course, always the alcohol um, sanitizing stations, and those are great solutions as well. Um, but I, I think it's important to note that there is no, um, 
you know, there's, there's no magic cleaner that's going to make this better. You should use what's appropriate for the material and the, um, the operation that you're currently undergoing. So in some cases you might use a diluted bleach or a soap or alcohol, it just depends on the situation. And you might want to think about what cleaners are available where in your facility as you begin to, to plan out your cleaning and hygiene practices. And then again, as with hygiene, communicating with your customers is really key here. If you can um, increase your level of cleaning and make, make your customers more comfortable, it's just going to help you in the long run. And the last, uh, the last uh, thing I was going to cover with uh, what we do know now is uh, it seems like the reopening opportunities are going to be coming a lot faster, um, uh, especially here in the U.S. and some countries in Europe. Um, I know some countries in Europe are looking at p potential opening of gyms as early as the first week of May. Uh, here in the U.S., with some of the recent developments of the last uh, handful of days, um, uh, there's a a greater U.S. reopening strategy. Some states are taking advantage of that. Uh, gyms in Georgia might be able to open by the end of this week, potentially. Uh, we'll see um, where that actually ends up uh, by the end of this week. But um, some of these things people have to be thinking about pretty, pretty, pretty rapidly, and we're going to start to um, put out as much guidance as we can around this. Um, I think it's important to note, uh, you know, reopening uh, will not look like business as usual for almost every gym out there. I imagine every gym out there. Um, that could mean anything from limited occupancy to these cleaning and hygiene protocols uh, we were just discussing. Um, and it, it, it's important as you plan your policies around reopening uh, that you don't inadvertently damage your long-term business. Um, you don't want to put a policy in place that you have to now abide by forever, even though this crisis may only last six months or two years or whatever the time frame is. Um, and then as always, uh, lots of local ordinances out there. It could be at the county or city level in the US, um, could be at the state level. In other countries, it could be at your national level or your city level. Um, but find, find the most direct source of information for your gym and um, pay attention to that and follow any laws and guidance that they have. Um, so we'll open this up to the broader discussion. Um, feel, free to, feel free to start uh, throwing those hands in the air. Oh, we've got a couple questions already uh, typed in. And so as we begin to answer those, um, it'd be great to hear from you guys as well. Um, I'm gonna try to keep notes real time with any of the ideas that you guys um, pitch out at, at each other. And uh, we'll use this little, this matrix here to discuss some of the concrete steps that we have and some of the questions that we have uh, to, um, to kind of decide as a group on what the importance and the difficulty or cost of any of these ideas could be. So uh, just as a jumping off point, um, sanitizing holds is obviously a, a big question that a lot of people ask uh, very frequently. Um, that's a uh, potentially a low importance, low impact on risk in your gym, but a very high cost if you were to do that at a um, you know satisfactory level. Um, other things such as reducing occupancy is uh, is would would have a pretty big impact on um, on potential transmission since you're going to be more easily able to practice social distancing. Um, but obviously, a very high cost to your facility if you can't have the number of people inside to sustain uh, your business model. Uh, similarly, low root density. Uh, we might encourage some of the social distancing through root setting and other facility layout practices, whether that's moving fitness equipment further apart or having roots set um, you know, six feet apart. Um, another high cost but high impact activity. And again, anyone who'd like to um, you know, uh, move any of these around or cha challenge any of these assumptions, uh, yeah, please raise your hand or throw something into the chat. Um, Another question uh, that's used a lot is uh, hygiene stations, whether that's hand sanitizer or even hand washing stations out in lobbies and in climbing areas. Um, uh, those could be a lower cost, but uh, have a high impact on people's hygiene behaviors. Um, and then uh, the last one that I threw up here to seed the conversation is increased cleaning. Another one that can have um, pretty high impact and has, has a much lower cost than a lot of other, um, a lot of other opportunities. Um, so let's see with that, uh, feel free again to start throwing those hands in the air. Um, and, uh, looks, looks like we got a couple questions in the question box and question on, um, 
uh, Liquid Shock in the chat. Liquid Shock's um, you know great one to throw on this list. So I'm just going to throw this right up here. And uh, I'd love to hear from you guys what you think the efficacy and the difficulty of using liquid shock will be. Um, from our end at the CWA, we are looking at, um, at uh, the interactivity, or trying to look at the interactivity between shock and, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically. Uh, we had one researcher from a university in Quebec reach out to us to offer their assistance in that. We don't have a clear timeline or um, or outcome from that study yet, um, and uh, it's something we're working towards. But uh, it might be it might be a, a good amount of time before there's a clear answer from from or uh, the beginnings of a clear answer on that, uh, since it'll still just be one study. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to throw their hand in the air and share their thoughts on liquid shock, I'd love to hear from you. All right, let's hear from uh, Dr. John Hannawell. Hey y'all, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, this is John Hanwell. I'm an ER physician in Twin Falls, Idaho, owner and co-owner of Gemstone Climbing Gym. Um, personally, I think it's a great time for a cultural shift towards liquid chalk. Uh, this is kind of the same idea of what we do in the hospital where we hand sanitize going in and out of every room when we see a patient. This will be useful not only for what we currently are seeing, but any further pandemics or uh, fomites in the future, anything from MRSC to VRE, all sorts of things of that nature. Um, there are studies that are showing that there's active virus that is present on plastic up to 80 hours after exposure. And uh, yeah, we can't deal with all that all the time, but at the same time, decreasing the amount of contact from individuals onto holds makes a lot of sense to have people sanitizing their hands before they climb. It works as a great base layer, and a lot of pros are using it only one application before heating up their routes and are doing just fine with it. I love my chalk bag, and I know this is a big cultural shift, but it does make a lot of sense, and I know a lot of new research does need to happen. But we're also dealing with a time course where doing double-blinded controlled studies are going to be very difficult to perform in an urgent manner. This would also help greatly in public opinion, who are all hand sanitizer frenzied, that's just my opinion as of now. Thanks. Um, yeah, if you, if you stay uh, unmuted there for a second, a uh, follow-up question that you just made me think about um, is the one thing we could do potentially as a hygiene suggestion is to ask climbers to wash hands between routes. So before you start climbing and once you get off the route, that'd be, uh, I think, more or very similar to, you know, some of your protocol in the hospital, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what do you think about that idea? You know, it'd be wonderful, but I think buy-in would be very difficult to properly wash hands. You know, that's 20, 30 seconds of actually hand washing, plus washing, walking to a hand washing station where you don't want these people necessarily walking through bathrooms or so on. And not many of us have specific hand washing stations outside of a bathroom set up. Yeah. And, and that's a, that'd be a great one to hear from other people if um, if people are starting to invest in additional hand sanitizing stations or hand washing stations. I know um, a few gyms have tried, and it's uh, it's harder to get that that type of um, equipment right now since it's being used and or being added to so many hospitals and retail um, facilities as well. Um, let's see. So we got some loot. All right, got a couple other. Let's hear from you, Cedric, on um, the if you're talking on the liquid shock question or anything else you might have. Uh, yeah. Hi, this is Cedric. A uh, couple of different thoughts. If you can't uh, find hand washing stations like normal, uh, what we did before we had to close is I called a, the companies that supply porta potties and. Uh, hand washing stations for like renaissance festivals and so we were able to lease one uh, and put them outside both of our facilities and we required all of the customers to wash their hands before coming in the building and then um, we uh, were able to implement a couple of uh, hand sanitizer stations at each facility so the combination of washing your hands before coming in and then having hand sanitizer available in those 
nifty little dispenser things were a couple of things that we were looking at. And you, you had mentioned liquid chalk. Uh, I know that Friction Labs has produced 80% uh, alcohol liquid chalk. And so I know that that's something that they're pretty psyched about getting out. That's it. All right. Thanks, Cedar. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, yeah, and I think the liquid chalk question is one that will be ongoing. Uh, I think that falls into uh, right now that hygiene category of just trying to do the best you can. Maybe it's not so important that it, we don't know for sure that it's um, the same as hand sanitizer. Maybe it's something that will make your customers more comfortable, and that's not that's not anything to take lightly. Um, uh, take a quick peruse of other questions here. Um, in the chat, I see an interesting question about um, um, more frequent use of non-abrasive cleaners um, for uh, for handholds specifically. Um, not sure what uh, what that question is, but I'd love to hear from anyone who's um, looking at. I'm assuming that means that they're going to be cleaning holds in place on the wall, or at least thinking about it. Love to hear anyone who's whose thoughts are going around those that area as well. And well, let's hear from uh, Brian on that. Hi, this is um, Brian from Albuquerque. Um, so we've looked a little bit into different cleaning options. Um, we have changed the uh, type of soap that we are using for uh, cleaning our climbing holds to a to a uh, disinfectant soap that we get from our janitorial supplier. Um, it does have a claim to um, be effective against coronavirus with a 10 minute soak time. So that's currently what we're doing right now is um, we're using, uh, it's, uh, it, this particular product happens to be from Brady Janitorial. Um, it's their lemon disinfectant. It's um, reasonably inexpensive um, and uh, basically our process at this point is we have a uh, like a 50 gallon stock tank um, that we uh, 100 gallon stock tank with 50 gallons of water in it that we put our climbing holds in soak them in uh, the solution um, to the um, concentration that's recommended um, for 10 minutes and then we're doing a power wash. Um, I know um, a few weeks ago um, when we had the uh, emergency room physician on the talk, um, they were recommending not to use power washing, but I really don't see getting away from it in our process. And um, in my mind anyway, if we're uh, soaking them in the disinfectant for 10 minutes, there, there shouldn't be um, a problem with power washing afterwards. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a fairly reasonable conclu uh, conclusion, um, and especially as long as, uh, you know, your employees have uh, the regular proper PPE they'd have during um, power washing anyway, like respirators. It, I would think it'd be pretty uh, low risk. But let's hear from uh, from John on that. Um, you should be unmuted. Hey, I 100% uh, agree with you, and that's actually what I was stating in my initial rant at that time, was that... Uh, before power washing, which has a potential for aerosolizing, because we're dealing with two separate things here. Droplets, which go for potentially six feet, maybe up to 12 feet RNA has been found, which is questionable whether it's active virus or not. That's just droplet from coughing, breathing. Then we're dealing with aerosolization. That's the super dangerous one. That's the one that's killing everybody in the uh, in ICUs and in Europe. That's when you actually get a gaseous form that can hang around the air for up to three hours. What I was recommending at the time is before you power wash, trying to kill the virus and doing something of a soak, anything from just a low pH solution of something very simple. I think we're using some, uh, oh, geez, I can't say off the top of my head, some Arm & Hammer product, but anything with a pH of eight to nine, well, pretty much nine and above, uh, sitting in there for a couple hours, if not overnight, is great. If you can let the hold sit for three days, just sitting out to five days, just sitting out with nothing on them, that would probably be fine as well. But a soak is a great idea prior to power washing. And having somebody wearing a mask is beneficial at that time. Sure, that might be overkill because the virus is already unactivated. And having a power a washing station within your facility 
you know, that's the other thing, whether you need to have that ventilated or not. I think if the virus is already deactivated, you should be just fine power washing inside. That's what I highly recommend. Um, if you want to get all sorts of paranoid, you'll do it outside. But I think that's, that's getting on the far end of all this. But yes, the answer is soaking them before power washing. Wonderful idea. Yeah, thanks for that, John. And, and you, yeah, you covered the other um, thing I was going to mention about that as well, which is the possibility of being able to just quarantine those materials for a certain amount of time, um, four days, maybe a week, um, whatever you're comfortable with and, and gels best with um, current science could be um, a great strategy as well. Um, and, and one that can uh, transfer over to rental gear uh, potentially as well. Um, let's see, we've got a, let's hear from Catherine here. Uh, Hi, uh, this is Kasha from uh, oh. Central Rock. Um, I was just wondering if, if the holds have already been on the walls and the gyms have been closed, so the virus obviously shouldn't be on them anymore, but then the concern would be if we reopen and someone were to come in that has the virus, then the, the holds have the virus on them again. At that point, it seems like we'd have to close every, like, be open for a day and then close for like three or four days to get rid of it again. So I don't really know if there really is a point of washing the holds any other way than what we already do. Um, and I think it just ends up being a big kind of mess at that point. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's where, you know, some of the hygiene guidance and some of that, um, you know, realization that we're not going to have hospital rooms for climbing gyms uh, comes into into play. Um, and, and I think that can come that can come into your communication strategy with your climbers as well is that there's there's a very real possibility that, um, you know, your gym is about as risky as a supermarket or any other store that begins to, to reopen at the same time as, as the gym. Um, people are going to be having to make some sort of personal decisions about their, their individual hygiene and their comfort with the hygiene practices of, of any given facility. Um, um, I'd, I'd love to hear some pushback on that as well, see if anyone feels like we should have a, a higher standard of care than that. Um, let's hear from Clint. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello, everyone. Another Idaho attendee. I'm calling from the Commons Climbing Gym in Boise, Idaho. Uh, it seems to me kind of playing off of um, that last question that if we could also pot potentially look at doing something like if we're thinking the virus is active for a few days on climbing holds. Could we do something like mini quarantines in terms of opening the gym for, uh, let's say, a few busy days, like over the weekend, and then close down for the following two or three days so that we are essentially re sanitizing the entire space? Yeah, I think that that mirrors what Kasha was saying to a large degree. Um, I, it's certainly not something that uh, would be impossible, I think, for a gym to do other than the way that it would impact their individual business model. Uh, the question I would have around that would be around, uh, you know, what happens during that busy day, I mean, having one super risky day versus three days of sanitizing things um, isn't necessarily going to lower the risk in, in your facility, depending on who shows up during that busy day and how they behave. Um, not to, <laughs> not to be too, um, uh, pessimistic about it, but I think those are the kind of things that we have to we have to uh, think about as we're as we're going through all these issues. Uh, let's hear from Brian. Um, yeah, I would just uh, like to make a comment that I think that um, focusing on sanitizing our holds that are on the wall is probably something that would is just going to be ineffective and. I don't even know if it's really worth um, focusing on. Um, I personally don't see the climbing gym to be any worse than your regular grocery store as far as touching surfaces. <clears throat> and I think a lot of the research out there um, indicates that the primary method of transmission 
is person to person um, through cough droplets or um, you know that six foot radius. So I think the most important thing that we really need to figure out is how do we keep people separated in the gym? And how do we, um, you know, certainly encourage hand washing and hand sanitization. But um, there's, there's absolutely no way that we're going to sanitize every climbing hold in the gym. And I just don't know that it's even worth trying to. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say that mirrors um, my review of things as well. Again, with the caveat that, uh, you know, a lot of the science is still in development. Um, but uh, to me, from what I've seen, what I've uh, been looking at, um, and and heard very similar conclusions from some of the other international climbing organizations, is the the climbers sitting around in a circle on the mats between burns are at much higher risk than the climber on the wall touching holds, especially if they are following uh, good hygiene. Um, looks like we got another uh, um, comment from Dr. Hanwell. I'll just go ahead and unmute you now. Yeah, just to adjust the uh, sanitizing holds, the only thing that soaking the holds would benefit is the person washing the holds and our people in the general vicinity that will be exposed to the aerosolized virus when the holds are being washed. It's by no means a good practice to do after every time a hold gets touched. If we wanted to be super paranoid at the onset, it would be only bouldering and spraying down between different groups rotating through areas with alcohol in the holds. Again, that's super high intensity and probably totally... Uh, unfeasible. That's why doing the uh, liquid chalk, now not just liquid chalk, the 80% uh, chalk to decrease the transmission for people's boogers directly onto the holds as they're climbing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. More importantly, or equally as important, is the uh, the contact or the uh, droplet precautions of the individual climbing with both spacing as well as masks. Now, just to close the rabbit hole of the contact to holds, a lot of the European stuff says, oh, you know, there's no such thing as direct contact causing virus. That I think the Vertical Life had quoted with one of their initial papers. That's not true at all. There are many studies that are demonstrating that this virus is sticky and does attach. Uh, CDC just produced a wet paper earlier today, or a temporary paper, that shows that it does adhere to surfaces and that is a big risk. Now that's from the initial China study, which I don't like the power, meaning not many samples were done and they used RNA, which if you guys are looking for this, when they do say something called PCR, that means they just swab it and look for the virus particles. That doesn't mean active virus. But there are studies out there that actually use different uh, cellular cultures, which are super expensive and, if you're, and hard to do. So if you're asking about, can we do studies to test climbing holds, to test where this virus is, you know, those studies are the ones that require the cellular studies which are, take a long time. If you are gonna test with the PCR, the RNA, sure you can say if there's a heck of a lot of RNA on something, it's likely an active virus. And that's kind of what the CDC one is based on if you look at their table and data. So just to close the loop on the touching the climbing holds, preventing the actual boogers from getting onto the holds themselves with frequent application of either hand sanitizer or a good cultural shift would be that liquid chalk with the high alcohol. Um, and the only reason for doing the, hand, the sanitizing before washing is protecting your holds, uh, your route setter and their, their washing modalities. But yeah, I think masks is a wonderful discussion to have. And I think personal distancing and uh, amount of people let into a gym and what sort of spacing they should have is also a really important thing that we should be discussing. All right. No, thanks for that, John. I, I think that, um, yeah, that's something that gets lost in translation in a lot of the mainstream news articles that people read about and um, can sometimes add to uncertainty the difference between uh, an active um, culturable virus versus the presence of RNA um, and not jumping to conclusions one way or the other about um, uh, what the actual contact transmission um, possibilities are. Um, as an extension of that, so you were just uh, mentioning masks. Uh, we have a lot of questions about masks. Um, it, some of the guidance there is is uh, 
want, depending on uh, which country you're looking at uh, and which uh, regulations you're looking at. I was wondering if you have any personal opinions about types of masks that people might allow or encourage or require in their gyms um, and their and their uh, efficacy. So something like a buff or a bandana that um, that isn't waterproof versus something like a surgical mask, which um, someone might be wearing. That's a wonderful question. Again, thank you all for being part of this discussion. You know, this goes above and beyond that you guys are interacting with us. Um, as far as masks go, don't purchase N95s. We know those in the hospital, those are only useful for aerosolized products. If you wanted to have one of the industrial ones with the big uh, hook on the side for your holds washers while they're washing, you know, it wouldn't be a horrible idea. Do I think it's mandatory? Probably not. I think if you wanted to make your holds washer uh, more secure in what they're doing, Sure, but they're also low risk individuals in the sense. Anyway, um, that's a different topic. Uh, as far as masks themselves, um, at least double cotton layer masks, maybe even triple layer, is probably appropriate enough. Anything that can catch little droplets. You see a lot of these goofy online things, people spraying aerosolized products through a mask. Of course, it's aerosol, it's going to go through a lot of these things. Surgical masks are great, and you know, if people want to bring them in, cool. I think having them available for everybody that comes to your gym is going to be infeasible because they're very hard to get right now. And you're talking about one mask per person for the whole time they're there, unless they bring it back in later, which will probably be all sorts of contaminated. So that's difficult. Right now, my group is getting, uh, we're crowdsourcing and having people sew masks for us doing double layer cotton masks. Again, I don't have great research on those, but it's kind of we're at the state of availability and what's prevalent and having people wear them will decrease the amount of actual droplets in the air. Not perfect. Not like you want to hang out next to somebody and have a good conversation, but at least it will decrease what gets on the hold. And more importantly, as they're climbing, because we talk about droplets, we talk about six feet. The six feet thing is very, um, a hydrant drum is where they get these studies from. Basically, it's in a closed environment with no airflow going through it and seeing uh, in that environment how far this virus particle can be found. It's not considering exchange rate of air. It's not considering the flow and dynamics of wind blowing through there. It's mainly just a, a, a scientific uh, experiment, but it's a good starting point. And we have to consider these droplets are gravity dependent, meaning as somebody's climbing up, they will fall down. And with that, you know, any sort of vector, I'm sure you guys are better at fixing it than I am, but as the vectors uh, pull these droplets down, they're gonna go a little bit farther than six feet. So preventing them from coming out, preventing folks from breathing on the holds, and preventing them from breathing on all sorts of other stuff, including your staff, is important to do. So yeah, for now, I think especially with public opinion, opening with masks, of any quality, preferably double cotton, if not anything more advanced, would be a, a good step to do. And if you guys have some data on this, as far as any sort of scientific studies done on these masks, that'd be really awesome to see. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit uh, in terms of what you guys can do. And we are, uh, we have a reopening committee that we're forming and a hygiene committee. And uh, in, internally in the CWA, we've been gathering a lot of research. There's uh, a couple studies on masks that um, uh, once we start publishing some of this guidance, we'll have links to. Um, and yeah, so that uh, something I think is going to be is going to be an ongoing, you know, body of research that that's getting developed um, in response to COVID-19. But it's uh, uh, depending on which study you look at, you kind of get different answers now. So I don't know if there's um, uh, really, really strong um, data out there. There was a great uh, CDC effort from um, about about five years or about six years ago in response to the 2009 H1N1 um, epidemic. And um, from that study, they were looking at four layers of cotton as being one of the one of the base points. And that was for a different disease with, with with different characteristics. They were really focused on influenza with that. But uh, we'll, we'll we'll try to make links to those um, to those research um, topics available as we begin to publish this information. Um, really great question in in the uh, question uh, dialog box about what gyms are going to do uh, to help change behavior with their customers and and how you guys are going to handle members who are resistant to this kind of behavior modification. Um, and uh, that's something that will probably be a little bit uh, dependent on uh, different states. And you'll have to look at, at what what your rights are to disallow service to people. But I'd say at the, at the strongest um, 
at the strongest level, you can just not allow someone to climb at your gym um, if uh, if they're especially problematic. Um, and I again going back to the beginning of of uh, this talk, um, I think that you know strong communication both through social media, email campaigns, posters in your gyms, uh, all of those kind of means will help reinforce uh, what you expect from your climbers and and hopefully the the broader social impact of everything that's going on will. I hopefully make people more conscientious uh, around uh, these issues. Um, but I'd love to hear it, anyone out there who's uh, internally had any discussions with their staff or their team on how they're going to handle communicating um, this, these behavior changes and what they expect uh, of their members. Okay. All right. Well, that's a tough one. And um, yeah, one that'll be, again, very individual to, um, you know, whatever your local laws are. Um, another another top question in here is regarding uh, harness rentals. Uh, I would probably include like maybe shoe and chalk bag rentals, lead ropes, all of those things that um, that you might be lending out to your customers. Um, it, I think that goes back to some of the uh, quarantining um, discussion that we talked about earlier, even for climbing holds. Uh, that might be a good uh, procedure for rental gear, and then uh, a lot of that stuff is is pretty cleanable with uh, warm water and soap. Um, any of those, any of the individual products that you use should have uh, technical specs or data sheets um, available for uh, that will give you methods for cleaning. Um, and it looks like I got uh, Rich here. He'd like to weigh in on that. I'm gonna unmute you, Rich. Hey everybody, uh, this is Rich Bruner from Ben Rock Gym. Um, to actually to to the first point about you know behavior and and managing behavior. One thing we were looking at is actually not necessarily like updating our waiver necessarily, but adding a new document that um, any member that comes and climbs in the facility you know signs and agrees to. Um, and so that would outline kind of what our expectations are, what the operating standards are and protocols are, and they're agreeing to abide by those things while they're in the facility. So that's one additional sort of uh, uh, practice that we might put into place. And then with regards to, you know, rentals and things like that, again, given every state's going to be different, but our state, you know, if, when we do get to reopen, it's going to be under such a limited amount of people that we probably, we're exploring simply operating on um, and serving members and punch card holders only. And so those folks typically nine, 0.5 or more times out of 10 have their own equipment and therefore don't need to rent ours. Um, furthermore, you know, one other idea that we're kind of looking at is making the gym uh, effectively lead climbing only in the rope areas. Um, so that's just sort of taking our equipment out of the equation and reducing the need for us to necessarily disinfect it on a regular basis. So Anyway, thanks everybody. I uh, just wanted to add those two points. Thanks for hearing me out. Awesome. Uh, looks like I uh, got Dr. Hanwell again. Uh, I'm gonna unmute you, doctor. Hey, so lead climbing is a great question. I've been wondering about this because what do we all do? We bite the rope. And then what do we do? We clip it into the draws. So those draws would be a contact point that a rope is always sliding through. So, and directly to people's mouths. So, and that's a that's a cultural shift we'll have to make them no biting the rope. You're right, people would be using their own rope, but they are all going through the same draws. So, you know, that's like kind of a plus minus. I've been wondering about myself how to address that. All right, thanks. Um, let's see, anyone else out there uh, with uh, a take uh, either unique or otherwise on rental gear? Okay, uh, oh, had a couple of people raise and lower. Um, Is that okay? Um, well, let's see. Got another question here on social distancing and uh, doing a calendar based access. Uh, so, this would be similar to uh, the strategy document the Vertical Life put out, where they were um, looking at potentially having bookable time slots in a gym. Um, is anyone out there planning on opening like that? Planning, or um, as uh, we just heard, um, as we just heard from Rich, planning on opening just for members or just for members plus punch card holders. Um, 
Let's hear from Rich again. See your hand went up. Yeah, so uh, yeah, in addition to members and punch card holders, again, for us, it's likely gonna be, uh, it looks like from what the documentation is, is that if a gym's able to open in our state, it'll be under the sort of strict social distancing guidelines of like gatherings of less than 10 people, for example. So we're looking at, yeah, kind of taking our operating day, like a seven day operating schedule and breaking each day into, you know, 90 minute to two hour chunks that then a member or punch card holder can go online and pre-register for. Um, you know, we're still working out the details as to, you know, can a member book multiple slots in a day? Do we limit how many slots somebody can book in a day? You know, can they book back to back slots? Um, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of logistical implications and policy implications to operate in that way, but that's, that's actually, but we're, I'm pretty confident that we are going to reopen um, in that sort of frame, using that sort of framework. And uh, where, where are you guys located? We're in Bend, Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. I had this uh, question in the comments about uh, for any gyms in, or in the question and answer box, any gyms in Georgia that are looking at the possibility of reopening Friday and, uh, and looking at that seriously. If anyone's out there, just go ahead and throw your, your hand up. We'll, we'll get you on, um, on the call. And it uh, looks like I got uh, Dr. Hannah well again. Yeah, I think keeping them separated is a great idea. Having time slots is a great idea. Ideally, having groups of people at least six feet apart, if not 12 feet apart, would be a good thing. You know, we talk about groups. Now, those are people from households that have already been co-exposed because you got to consider this virus potentially has a, a lot of asymptomatic carriers. And the one of the theories is the kids are the ones that transfer it all around because they're kind of gross. <laughs> Just kidding. Mine are at least. But um, it is something that keeping them separated, having different lanes and different areas, kind of like the grocery store idea of things on the ground is a wonderful thing. Also to consider egress and, uh, and well, in and out of the gym where different paths should be so people don't cross these natures. Um, and lastly, you know, this kind of also translates into what are we going to be doing in our workout studios as well as our yoga studios? Are we going to be transferring those or opening those early? And I think it kind of goes along the same ideas of having areas isolated. So to kind of close it is that people from the same household can definitely share a zone. Uh, zone should be separated out, and uh, meaning that uh, at least I would recommend having a zone of about 20 feet so that people can utilize that area. That includes potentially three to four rope routes or a bouldering area. Maybe rotate people through a couple of the zones. That would make sense. All right, thanks. And it looks like we have uh, Rob with his hand up as well. I'm going to unmute you, Rob. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, I have another question here with a lot of uh, upvotes. Are, are you there, Rob? Yeah, sorry. I forgot to click the unmute button. That's always useful. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> um, so we're doing kind of the same thing. We're going to open to members only initially uh, and put them on a schedule. Um, I think the hardest part for us is trying to figure out how many we will limit um, the gym to initially, you know, we've got a 10,000 square foot facility, 13,000 counting our mezzanine, which is our bouldering wall. Uh, we are, by the way, uptown climbing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, but a couple of thoughts we've had are um, with respect to managing all of our roped uh, stations um, are kind of a, a lockout tag out procedure whereby we will um, only allow use of 50% of the ropes alternating and we'll tag out ropes and then every day we'll rotate members to another set of ropes and whether we do that every third rope or every other rope that would at least let the ropes hang uh, and be unused for a period of time whether we can make the 80 hour number I don't know uh, another thought that we have specific to auto blaze uh, and I've, I've found some plastic sleeving online uh, and essentially um, taping plastic sleeving up the Audible um, strap uh, straight down to the carabiner so that we can clean at least those uh, carabiners very easily without worrying about a chemical load on uh, any of the soft um, 
uh, soft goods, and then you can easily wipe the plastic on the banding. I don't have kind of a solution for top ropes yet to protect them other than time. So just a couple of thoughts there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, th that idea of alternating top rope stations is, is a pretty interesting one. I haven't heard come up from anyone else before. Um, looking at uh, the questions here, uh, there's a, a, another popular one about cleaning agents. And I see a couple of questions in the chat about that as well. I think someone asking um, what cleaning solution uh, was being used to soak holds. Um, there is a great list of um, cleaning agents in uh, on the EPA's website that, that, that have been tested specifically with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I'm going to go ahead and throw a link to that in the chat so you guys can all see it. And then that link is also always on our coronavirus resource page um, at climbingwallindustry.org slash coronavirus. Um, so uh, that, that, that's a great resource to, the EPA website's a great resource to look at for what is currently being being um, evaluated and, and used uh, for different disinfectants. Um, on that question of social distancing, there's an interesting one about kids, and I know that John brought that up briefly as well, um, whether there's any extra, uh, extra level of care we need around uh, children since they might be, um, might be a little bit, might be introducing more risk into your gym than your other climbers. Um, anyone out there considering their policies on reopening when it comes to youth versus adults accessing the gym? All right. Let's see. Um, Uh, here's, here's an interesting question um, for the group. Oh, we got another. <laughs> uh, got okay, here's another interesting question for the group, um, and it's about the the floor uh, in the climbing gym. So I would imagine both your mats and then also just your general traffic areas. Um, someone's saying they've seen some um, news about the virus being transferred on the bottom of shoes and what kind of contact um, is is there. Uh, let's hear from John again. Cool. Thanks for calling me, John. The whole Dr. Hanwell thing's getting me freaked. Um, yeah, the, the study that was just put on the CDC website talks about floor contamination. That's one that I referenced earlier. That's one of these Wuhan studies. Now, the deal is I can get concerned about that is you got to look at the power of the study. The power means how much or how many actual swabs were done. And if you look at that, you know, the big thing is, oh, it showed up 100% in the laboratory. Well, that was two swabs from the ground showing a large amount of RNA. Um, so we're not talking about active virus, talking about large RNA. So yeah, if you're going from the ICU and you're walking into a location, uh, could you be tracking something? By all means, you could. But you also got to consider viral load, meaning that if somebody coughs in your face, that's a bunch of virus going right in your mouth. That's definitely high risk of transmission. But the more and more we get distracted away from that, the less and less virus is there. Now, this is like a I don't know the exact virility of this virus. Of course, it's high, um, but it's something that will get diluted down. So you gotta consider somebody coughing on the ground, you walking through that, you using your shoe, touching a hold, and then that hold transference back to a hand, that's really decreased. So, you know, if we're talking about areas that will have highest impact versus lowest impact, um, floor surface and tertiary are farther out different contacts, we're talking about less and less of a viral load. So of course it's going to be present. There's no way to eliminate this all together. But we got to consider what would decrease it the most. So as far as bouldering mats, yeah, we are falling down onto them. We are coughing. We are yelling, screaming, and falling onto those, which has more uh, uh, droplets that are let down onto it, if not potentially aerosolized, but we won't get into that topic. Um, so yeah, boulder mats can potentially have something but you gotta consider what the contact is with the bouldering mouth directly to people's face. And that's where it comes into a big thing of really simple, don't touch your face, don't eat food, things of that nature. And that's why really having the hand sanitizer aspect of the chalk or having repeated washing is a great thing for people to have self-protection from that. As far as washing your floors and washing your mats, you know, of course, wash your floors, make your gym look super clean, that's public opinion. But as far as washing your bouldering mats, you know, 
once it's exposed, it's exposed. You know, sure, you could make an argument that's accumulation over a couple of days. And if you do want to get paranoid and wipe down your mats after every day, that could only help. You know, the more steps you have that your staff has to do, the more complicated it's going to be. And if you can add those on, sweet. But then again, you know, you got to, again, hit that low-hanging fruit. You know, the things of cleaning the hands, it holds cleaning or having people's hands be clean, cleaning the uh, the commonly touched surfaces such as the sign-in pads, such as the front door of your gym and doing that multiple times a day, such as the connections of the auto belay. I love that idea of the plastic on there as long as it doesn't get sucked up in the auto belay. Um, you know, different areas to think about would be whether to leave belay devices on whole, on the uh, on the routes. But then again, you have to consider sanitizing those between each group coming through or leaving knots and uh, beaners tied on. But again, sanitizing those between each group. Um, Ed Aaron, I'm, I'm digressing. Mm -hmm. On to you guys. Yeah, as, as I was going to say, uh, a, a, little, um, a little thing I noted uh, in, in your uh, comments just there was the yelling, screaming, falling on the mats. Uh, there's another question in here, which is a great one. Um, can the virus be transmitted through sweat? Um, and someone's thinking specifically about landing on a bouldering mat. Um, it, I have, a, uh, I think the current science is that there is no transmission through sweat, blood, or even um, feces, although again, sometimes RNA can be present in some of those materials. I know there's one study in Germany and then uh, one that was done in uh, China as well that supports that, the, again, with the caveat that maybe that will be um, something that gets uh, discredited in the future or as more science gets done. But uh, currently, I don't think there's any um, general worry about those transmission methods in the in the medical community anyway. And uh, I'm sure John will um, speak up if uh, if I'm wrong there. Or I hope you will. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, you know, I'll have to scratch my head. There is a study that I looked at a little while back that showed the locations where the virus is most common. This was uh, kind of helping us to figure out locations of testing whether it was from doing it from the mouth, doing it from the back of the nose, doing it from a bronchoscopy, meaning washing out the lungs. And yeah, it, I know our GI doctors were talking that it was present in feces and they're talking about having a mask up and they're doing colonoscopies. So, you know, that's something that sweat, maybe. But yeah, I consider sweat in the hands is pretty much the same thing as somebody just having it, having their hands touch their face. And you got to assume everybody's picking their boogers. So anything like any hand contact to anything, you have to assume that that's uh, that's contaminated. That's a great comment. Um, uh, here's here's an interesting question about liquid shock. Um, so someone's asking, how long is the alcohol effective after the first dip? Would it still help forty five feet up? Um, and uh, no, as soon as as soon as that alcohol is evaporated, it's it's gone. Um, so if you were to you know, hand sanitize or use liquid chalk at the beginning of a route. Um, by the time that's evaporated, um, likely before you even step onto the wall, uh, its disinfectant powers would be would be uh, used up, for for lack of a better way to phrase that. Um, and then another interesting question there about liquid chalk is uh, whether liquid chalk would just incre increase the respiratory comfort of the entire environment in the climbing gym. And I think that's a, a really interesting question, but um, one that um, uh, it isn't so specific to the current pandemic anyway. Um, and maybe we'll get some uh, interesting data out of that uh, as, as a ride along to um, what gyms start to um, implement as they reopen, uh, similar to some of the uh, pollution effects we've seen of, of uh, the current shelter in place orders around the world. Uh, here's the, another great question in the in the question and uh, answer box. Are there any ideas of how we can guide our members to social distance? I've heard about creating climbing lanes. Not sure how effective or realistic those ideas are in practice. Um, you know, seen some uh, discussion of taping out uh, areas of the floor, similar to what many of you, have, I'm sure, have seen in your grocery stores. Um, ideas of sparser root density. Um, had a great suggestion on this call of alternating um, uh, root access. Um, from one day to the next to to allow for some time between climbers. Um, any other ideas out there on uh, on how you've been looking at uh, working with social distancing in your gym? All right, go ahead, John. Um, tape on the floor, you're gonna regret it. Things are gonna get sticky on there. By all means, you can using something like sidewalk chalk and drawing on your mats and drawing on that area is 
depending on what you have, might work great. I know Vertical Life, they're kind of an online uh, forum for uh, remembering where your routes are on the wall. That's a cumbersome process, but that's a different topic. Um, but I think one of their ideas is just drop on a route between different top broken groups. So you have uh, one group that's able to, you know, not necessarily encroach on another because there's a, a vacuum of, of holds between the two groups. All right. Um, and yeah, and I, I think it's uh, this is another one of those areas um, that's really important to note, similar to the question of like, how do I clean my climbing holds? There's other parts of your gym as well. Um, so when you're thinking about some of those social distancing, um, the space required and the and the communication methods required around social distancing is not necessarily just when someone's on the wall. It's your fitness gym, your yoga studio, your the entrance to your gym. Um, I know a lot of facilities out there in, in pretty small places with small hallways and or small passageways between different climbing sections. Um, so it would be it might be worth taking a look at all of those um, all of those areas in your individual facilities and considering them. Um, Let's see. Well, we're coming to the uh, coming coming to eleven o'clock. So I I wanted to uh, let you guys know what you can do to help um, continue this conversation. This is really great hearing some of the ideas you have and some of the concerns you have. Uh, we have a ton of questions um, that we didn't get to, and a lot of really great comments in the chat. Um, from our end, we'll try to uh, go through those, distill them, maybe publish a blog article, and we'll definitely have more calls like this in the future. Um, right now, a lot of the work groups around the world that we're working with and um, our work groups are getting um, are getting built and starting to uh, work on this topic specifically. So uh, if you if you'd like to, um, please volunteer. Uh, you can uh, just register right at climbingwallindustry.org slash volunteer. Uh, we've got volunteers right now working on these hygiene questions on reopening policies and how they gel with um, both uh, the business concerns and the safety concerns. And uh, we also have um, a, a lot of people working really um, diligently on the public policy and lobbying side, um, you know, just paying, all, just paying attention basically to what the local developments are in each region around the country and, and in some other countries as well, uh, such as Canada. Um, so if you feel like you have the time and the expertise or the interest to help in any of those projects, uh, just sign up with that volunteer form. We'd love to have you. Um, if you do come across anything that you find interesting, always feel free to share that information with us. You can um, send that to advocacy at climbingwallindustry.org, especially if it's around any of these specific issues. Um, and then um, we'll be continuing to work on all of these challenges to get you guys as much guidance as possible. Um, right now, most of our updates will be going through our, our newsletter. Uh, we've been publishing that at a, at a higher um, frequency than we normally do. So just keep paying attention to that. We'll cover everything from the business sides that uh, of things that you guys need to pay attention to, to any of these hygiene uh, topics that we just discussed. We're going to continue researching all of these ideas and um, working towards providing that guidance for you. I think what we'll eventually see is a digital white paper that we can update real time. Um, back to that initial caveat that we started with the call, all of the science is, is pretty young for this specific disease. Um, there's a lot of great research for other diseases that we can um, rely on as well to, to develop, to develop um, more actionable information sooner. So we'll be looking at that to begin with. And then as new studies and new guidance from the health organizations uh, becomes available, we'll incorporate that into our into our digital white paper. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this as well, uh, we are collaborating with other groups that are working on this around the world. My hope is that um, the entire global climbing community can have a fairly solid and fairly cohesive um, guidance on this. That'll help us when we're communicating to any of our local public health officials, and they might want to know why are you doing this this way? You can say that's how everyone in the world's doing it, and hopefully um, from a very science and evidence-based um, platform as well. And then, as always, we'll continue communicating you through, uh, with you guys um, uh, on a real-time basis, day in, day out. We're um, updating that coronavirus resource page as new information becomes available. So you can always tune into that for the latest. You can also see recordings of these webinars, and you can share that with, um, with anyone out there. Um, on Thursday, we have a, another webinar coming up. Uh, that's going to be uh, presented by Chris Stevenson, who many of you guys have, might have seen at our summits or our member meetings in uh, the fall last year. And we're going to be covering the topic of uh, what you guys can do as leaders to help um, 
help keep your staff engaged and positive through these closures, both um, your furloughed staff and your active staff. Um, one of the things I think we'll all have to start thinking about as we begin to look towards reopening is how we get our staff back uh, when we need them and how to keep those conversations going. Some people might find new jobs, some people might um, just have to move for, the, for a variety of personal reasons. Um, and uh, so we're going to look with uh, Chris at some strategies on how you can keep that communication alive and how you can help give some guidance to your staff and be leaders uh, in this uh, pandemic. As always, uh, the CWA is here for you. Just reach out to us personally with anything else um, that you might be thinking about or worried about. Um, and we'll see you on the call on Thursday. Thank you very much for all your time, everyone.